speak on some of those, Jason. I'm uh, still kind of trying to figure out which ones you know and which ones you don't. So, uh, but you did fine. You always do fine. I appreciate what you do. A whole, whole lot. Good to see everybody tonight. Thank you for coming out in this not so warm weather and come to worship the Lord. Uh, he knows you're here. We know you're here. There's praising and rejoicing in heaven because we are here to worship the Lord in that spirit and truth and also to learn about his word. Those that have been here since this series started, we first went through several chapters before we got to 19. <coughs> and when we got to 19, it would kind of make a little sense as to what was actually going on in 19 from the previous previous chapters. Tonight, I still had another verse here, but uh, we'll, we'll get to that, but that's all right. Uh, lesson 40 is where we are tonight, and in this particular one, it's don't wait for judgment. So if you look again at the reading that was read to us, and we'll look at verse 30, then Lot went up to Zor and dwelt in the mountains, and his two daughters were with him. He was afraid to dwell in Zor, and he and his two daughters dwelt in a cave. My first illustration point this evening is that when Lot saw that God and his angels spoke the truth, he finally wanted to get away. Now, I want us to think about this on the slide here, is they had tried to get Lot to hurry and get out of Sodom because destruction was coming. Not so sure that maybe he knew exactly how serious this was. But as he finally got out and the destruction has come upon that city, he finally here, he saw that God and the angels had spoken the truth about what was going on. And now he finally decided that he wanted to get away from Sodom. The whole truth of the matter is, he never should have been in Sodom to start with. And the second point is, when he got there and saw how bad it was, he should have got out and left. You don't hang around evil for very long for it to rub off on you. And eventually, it will decay you and it will ruin you, it will corrupt you if you allow it to hang around and stay for any length of time. Also, I said, do not wait until the hairs on your back or neck stand up. Believe what God does tell you. How many people do you know that they won't even look at the Bible? They won't even really pay any attention to it because they don't believe what it says. Many say, well, it's just a nice book, but it's a, it's a myth. Well, you, you can't believe anything in it. It was just written by a bunch of men. No. It was breathed into the man to pin down what the Holy Spirit gave them. Everything that is in this book is true. It is complete as God wanted us to have it. And if he wanted us to have any more of it, we would have had it. We have everything that we have in this book to have life and have immortality. And that's exactly what he's given us. He's given us life by breathing into us his breath giving us our soul. Also, when we become a Christian and receive his precious blood atonement, he gives us the gift of a Holy Spirit. And if we stay faithful unto him until the end, he's promised to give us a crown of life. I don't know why people want to wait around for when they've got everything that's assured by God that they can have to have a wonderful afterlife. In fact, I looked up the other day and told Christy we was on our way to Waco, say, and I said, Christy, do you know I have lived 67, I've lived 67 years. I said six months and 21 days as a Saturday. And I said, he told me on the little website that I'd lived so many hours and so many days since I had been born. And I said, when you think about how many days it was, and all that, it didn't seem like it was all that much. That kind of got me back to thinking about what the scripture says is life for a man is full of few days and not long after that we perish and die. I look every day to the coming of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. My prayer in the morning is <coughs> for 
Lord Jesus come quickly. I try to go over to John. He gave me a revelation in the 22nd chapter and look at those last verses at the end. Come quickly, Lord Jesus. I know there's people saying, well, you know, it's almost been 2,000 years since he came. You know, I just don't know whether I can trust that he's going to come. Well, the dispensation, if you think of the dispensation, they were so many thousand years and there was others that were longer than the first one. And we haven't quite been 2,000 years. I think we're 1982, 83 years since, since, the, uh, uh, since the death of Christ. I haven't been 2,000 years yet. He died in AD 33. We are not at 2033 yet. Therefore, it hasn't been 2,000 years yet. So it's getting close. And you may have lived long enough. I may have lived long enough to see 2033. But we'll just have to see how that goes. But remember, don't wait until the hairs and all the things that I've mentioned here start standing up before people begin to believe that what God says is what God means. People won't take what God says and stretch it here and stretch it there and say this over here and this over here. God knows what he means when he said it. He said in the, in the commandments, thou shalt have no other gods before me. He meant it. He meant what he told in the Mosaical Law and what he gave, gave in the Ten Commandments. He meant what he said. They want those people to do exactly the way that he told them to do it and how that he wanted them to do it. If you don't think you can get burned, just use clean fire and find out what happens. When judgment gets bad enough, compromising Christians try new forms of separation. Boy, they do. When the tough get things start getting tough when things are bad enough. Notice the word I used in there for Christians. What's that word that it says in it? Compromising Christians. Well, we won't do this and we won't do that and, and, and uh, we, we, we might do this and we might do that. Well, if you're doing what the Lord says, you don't have to compromise and do what he says. It's his will be done, not our will be done. His will be, to be done. And as we think about Lot, where was Lot on this? Was it God's will that he be in Sodom? Or was it his will to be in Sodom? Was it God's will to put those, those, those kids, those daughters in jeopardy? Or was it his will to do so? Was it his will to be inflicted with all of the evil in that town that that finally judgment was coming with fire and brimstone, or was it his decision to make his family live in that town, in that city? You see, he made some wrong decisions. And I think now that he finally has left and saw what happened, I think now that he knows that compromise was not the right solution for being able to stay where things are evil. As we look at this uh, in the passage here, Lot still moved by fear, though. The Bible tells us here he moved by, by fear. And notice now, Lot took his daughters and went to live in a cave. Notice the mountains, the name of the mountain, the mountains of Moab on the east side of the Dead Sea. Now, when we talk about Zor, I've looked up some things on Zor, and even though Zor was a small town, it was also a very wicked city. It was as wicked as Sodom. But what did the Lord allow Lot to do? He allowed him to still go to that wicked city. He didn't destroy it for the sake of Lot even though he told them all to get as far away as you can because I'm going to destroy all of those cities. See, God, many times, when it comes to saving a soul, he will do a lot of things to save that person. He'll let us escape and sneak out through things. He'll let us get away from evil. And he'll do everything he can to help us out but sometimes, you know, we just don't use common sense. You know, that's the sixth sense, is common sense. The other five senses, we know what they are, but the sixth sense is common sense. A lot of people just don't have any common sense. But 
do what in fact God has told them to do. But that ham was as wicked as Sodom was, and in the center of all this idolatrous city here, the center of idolatrous worship was going on in this particular town. I looked this up to see what many of the concordance of scholars had come up with and what the history was of this place, and it was a center of idolatrous worship in this very city, in that whole area. And Lot was probably, basically probably, afraid in many ways that God would bring judgment on that city too, even after he was there for a while. But God had told him that he wouldn't, and he didn't do it. Lesson 41, sin corrupts the innocent. Look at verse 31. Now the firstborn said to the younger, Our father is old, and there is no man on the earth to come in to us as the custom of all the earth. Come, let us make our father drink wine, and we will lie with him that we may preserve the lineage of our father. So my first bullet here, though the girls were virgins still living with their parents, their hearts were ruined. You think about kids that basically have been in the church for a long time, and it's time for them to go off to college. What do you think the percentage is by the time they go off to these colleges that don't want to have anything to do with God should they happen to have to go to one of those? How long do you think it takes for them to get corrupted a little bit before they don't even go back to church anymore? You know that percentage is high? Percentage is high of kids that have been raised in the church to follow the Lord that they have gone off to colleges and many of them don't even go back to church anymore after they leave. These particular girls here, even though they have never been with man and living with their parents, their hearts had already become ruined just by living and being around City. I looked up also, and it says the commentators have tried to excuse the girls every way possible, but there's no excuse. They tried to excuse them for what they decided to do concerning their father, and tried to excuse it as though it was okay for them to do that. Now, I don't know where you are about sins, and I know that all sins are sins. But you know, there are just some things that just, I mean, they just hit me. Homosexuality is hard for me to deal with, sodomy, but incest? I, I mean, they're just, they sick. And look what these girls were doing, trying some way to set up their own father have relationships with him because they thought that there wasn't anybody else alive but those three. Well, if he saved so if he saved Zor, there were some people still in Zor. Why didn't they know there were people there? Because they weren't going to go over to Zor because those people were there were still a lot of evil people in Zor. What would they probably have to those two girls. So they stayed away. And just think about it. Tried to, they tried to excuse the girls and some of these commentaries for the way in which that they acted with their father. Also, if they had any integrity, they could have asked their father and are sent for Abraham. Sent for him. He was still alive and he wasn't too far away. He was still uh, pretty close to that area. They could have sent for him. A lot of times when we get ourselves in situations, it's kind of like when people go out sometime to drink. What are they supposed to do when they've had too much? Phone a friend? Get somebody to come help drive them home? Call for a cab? What do you think that people ought to do today? they find themselves in situations that they need to get out of. They can have somebody call. Come get, come get me. Help me get out of this place here. Help me get out of this predicament. Or just walk away. 
Just walk away from it. A lot of people are too afraid to lose faith, to walk away from deadly situations. There's nothing more deadly than getting yourself in a sin so deep that when once you got into it, it might lead to other things and put you even deeper in a problem than you originally had. We think about Lot here. Think about where he is. He's in a cave with his two daughters. And his two daughters' imagination is starting to roam here about what can we do to repopulate the earth because there isn't anybody else that we can populate with except for dear old dad. And I also want you to know do not underestimate the power of compromise or hypocrisy on even young children. We don't want to have the power of compromise or being hypocritical when it comes to even young children. I mean, I, I, I just take back when I'll get a, the sound on my phone that has to do uh, with this kind of noise that lets me know that there has been, uh, there's been an alert go out because of these young kids. They've either been kidnapped or somebody's picked them up and they've been put into maybe a compromised situation to where they were out without having any kind of protection from those that were in charge of them. It's a sad world in which we live in that people cannot be trusted to keep hands off of little ones. But as we see here, we can see what it did possibly to these particular two girls here. Now here's their thinking as to why they wanted to do what they did. The commentators say that family and preservation of the family line was important in ancient times. In other words, the family name continuing, continuing, continuing was important. I know that in some of your families, you have that name that has continued on for a long time. Now, you can trace your ancestry back to maybe uh, the 18, 17, 16, 1500s. Some maybe even further than that, even, even uh, past uh, the Revolutionary War. Before that, you can trace your family back to that time. I know Krista was, is, was related to President Polk, and I'm trying to think you had somebody, Krista, in the in the Revolutionary War that was related uh, to the Peterson, uh, somehow related to uh, my mother's side. Mother's side, mm -hmm. mother's side. So she can trace her, a lot of her family back, uh, back that far. But it was important for the family line uh, in ancient times to continue to go. Now the area where a lot of his daughters were here, basically in Zor, they were living was largely uninhabited at the time as to where they were in that mountain. But Zor itself apparently still had some people there. Now let's, let's think about Lot now. Lot is old. He's not a young man here. And now he's also poor. Think about being old and poor. That's not a good combination there. You just don't have much of anything. And the third thing is all of his belongings that he had where are they? They're all burned up. Doesn't have anything except the clothes on his back and the clothes on the daughters uh, and, the, and the two daughters there. Because what's happened to dear old mom? She's turned into a pillar of salt. Now you think about what those girls have had to go through. They've lost their mother. The destruction of their city has completely been destroyed. They're now living in a cave, and they're trying to come up with some logical reason as to how to keep the bloodline going. Lot had neither the inclination at all that I can tell of here, or even the opportunity to make arrangements for his daughters to be married. He had no way of doing that now. If they did not have that done before they left, because those two men that they basically uh, were engaged to, 
apparently weren't very good because they wouldn't even leave the city. So the daughters had been in Sodom long enough to basically be influenced. How were they influenced? They were influenced by the low moral standards of that city. That's what influenced them. So it's not strange that the older daughter, and you, you get this, the older daughter would basically here suggest as incest the only way to preserve the family. Now could it be that they knew that if they asked a sober lot that his answer would have been no way. No way that that's going to happen. So what did they have to do? What did they think they'd have to do to get Lot in the situation so that he would be uh, compatible enough that they could try to do this? Well, they had to then go and try to get him drunk. He'd probably discouraged and might have been even a little depressed over what had happened to his life, how he had gone from a place that he was important and was at the city gate to the point that now the town is gone, his, his things are gone, his wife is gone, he's now in a cave and trying to do something to try to take care of his two daughters. So maybe they suggested to Lot that if he wanted to have a little help to forget about all of his troubles and all of his problems, that it might be good if he drank some wine. Why do people go to bars? <coughs> you say, well, to pick up girls. Well, that's part of it. What are some other reasons they go? Sometimes they're depressed. Sometimes they had a bad week. What's the drinking supposed to do for them? Calm them down? Make them not have to worry so much about what the week was like and how terrible things went and try to help them forget about it? Maybe the girl suggested here that it'd be better for him to drink some wine, make him feel better. Then the daughters, in turn, they wind up becoming pregnant through their father. And I say to you what a tragic scene this was about what happened. How tragic. It's tragic from the act that took place, but it's even also tragic as to what nations came out of those, of those children and what happened there. So we can see here that sin corrupts the innocent. 42, sin destroys hope. I'm still using the same passage of scripture here that we had just a few moments ago. The two girls had lost all hope through some erroneous concept of judgment on Sodom. Lost all hope. Now picture this. Let's say that there is an atomic bomb that is so big that it completely destroys the United States of America. Everything's gone. Everything's gone. Everybody's dead. Except for one guy and his two daughters. Think everybody's gone. Nobody else is alive. Do you think you can even see, as a dad, allowing what happened with Lot and the two daughters to even happen? Can you even conceive that that might, have, it might be a possibility? Apparently, they had to get him drunk in order to get this done. Could it be the girls had lost all kind of hope whatsoever trying to find some, some situation in order to make things better? Where were the girls going to finally get food and finally get to get things that they could live and survive? Doesn't tell us where that came from. It just says that they thought that they were the only ones that was in this cave. Just those three. Also, true believers are never without hope for they can and will call on him in any trouble. So if you are a true believer, if you are a person who is a true Christian, 
you're never without hope. You have got a direct pipeline to the mediator of all mediators to talk to God himself. And we should never lose hope that we have that before us, that when everything looks dark before us, before us everything is the worst that it possibly could be. We have that connection. See, it's there for us. It's there for a purpose for us to use it. That's why Paul said that we need to pray how often? Continually, as much as you possibly can. And so true believers, we can never lose hope that all that everything is, is bad, that everything is never going to get better because we have a God who is there for us. And the judgment was very limited scope. Zora was still there and Abraham was somewhere. Now it kind of makes me kind of wonder why did Lot not get out of that cave and go look for Abraham? Any of you ever thought about that in the scriptures? Why did he get out of that cave take his daughters and go look for Abraham? Man that's the first thing I would have thought of. I'm going to find Abraham. I know there's food there I know God takes care of him. I know God's blessed him. And I don't believe that he is dead. I would have taken off and tried to find where he was because he had already saved Lot several times. But I didn't say that he even looked to try to go see where he was. And then when God was chastened or punished, your family or you, I want you to know that there is still hope. Let's just do a passage of scripture here. If you would turn over to Psalm, the 27th chapter, and verses 13 through 14. Psalms 27, 13 through 14. I would have lost heart unless I had believed that I would see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Wait on the Lord. Be of good courage, and he shall strengthen your heart. Wait, I say, on the Lord. <clears throat> when God has to get kind of hard on us because of what we're doing or maybe punish us, there is still hope if we would just continue to wait on the Lord. And let me do this one more and then the lesson will be yours. Family infatuation is misguided. If we look at this and we still are looking at the same passage that we started with tonight, the daughters were infatuated with family and children for the sake of a family tree. That's what it's all about. It's about family tree and trying to repopulate the earth because they truly believe that there wasn't anybody else alive but those three people. That's what they thought. Even I guess they thought that even Abraham was dead. So the daughters were infatuated with a family and, and, and added to the family tree here. Now I put on here, you can excuse them as humbly keeping the creation and flood ordinances, but I will not. I won't go that far. I won't excuse them as feeling like that they were humble concerning creation and, and also the flood ordinances that there would always be that rainbow out there and everything would be wonderful and God would never destroy our water anymore. Maybe they thought he never it would, he destroyed the earth by fire and he'd never probably destroy it again. So they tried to look at what they had already heard or knew before and tried to excuse what they were trying to do. 
And I put on here that they did not need to commit incest with their father in order to replenish the earth. They didn't need to do it because not everybody on the earth had perished. First of all, Abraham had been told by God what was going to happen with his seed. He'd make it a great what? A great nation. So they had to believe that there were other people that were there upon the earth. But since they were in Sodom and not living with righteous Abraham, maybe there are some things that they never got told about the importance of God and what was going on with God and other people because they were in the wrong place at the wrong time. And they were a place where the anger of God and then God and Jesus both knew the terrible temptation from family members so they warned see God and Jesus they knew the terrible temptation with family members you go all the way back to Cain and Abel was there some temptation there with Cain and Abel was there some in the three sons of Noah did one of them kind of do something with Noah here? Was there some kind of relationship here, concerning relationship there? How about down the line when we get to uh, good old David? Did, get, did David, through temptation, did he have a few problems? Look at all the people in the scriptures that have had issues in their life, that have had family issues. Look at Tamar and what happened to her in David's household. And then think about wonderful Peter. Peter was one of the disciples of Jesus Christ, and can you hear what Jesus said to Peter? He said, Peter, now listen to these words. Usually when you become a Christian, you're converted. Yes? But he told Peter, he said, Peter, when you are converted, strengthen the brethren. Even Jesus, having been around Peter for a long time, even realized that he was not yet converted in believing everything about Jesus was the way it was. In fact, many of the disciples were not truly converted in many ways. A lot of them weren't truly converted until when? At Christ, until Pentecost. When they finally realized that he was who he said that he was. Family infatuation can be misguided. Fathers and mothers need to make sure that their children always are following God and doing what the Lord wants them to do. And I so glad every morning when I get up and I see those verses that you have on the computer. I read them. It highlights my morning. Gives me something to go on forward with. But I wish that we had people that when they get up in the morning they turn to the word of God and they would look at it and read it because it will fill your soul and it will make your day a whole lot better you have been blessed by having some of the word of God and have eaten some of that wonderful bread from the word of God. Next week we're going to look at lesson 44 reject sibling sinners and see what happens with them. We're getting close to the end. May be able to finish it next week. I'm hoping to. And we'll see how it goes. Aren't you glad you're a Christian? Aren't you glad that you have the blood of Jesus with you? Aren't you glad that you know that you have the hope of having eternal life if you'll just be faithful until you get to the end of the road? And then if he comes before you basically die in chains, that when he does come, that he will change you immediately and get rid of that flesh that you have and change into 
who are glorified body like unto his own son. Glorified body is what called us to be the heir and meet the Lord and be forever. I'm ready for that day to come. I'm ready for it right now. I'm ready for him to come any minute. Because there is a place up there that's a whole lot better than right here. Let's try to live our lives as Christ would have us live it every day of our lives so that we can hear those words. Come on in.